This evening's Bible reading is uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. And you can find this on page 1132 in the Pew Bibles, page 1132. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body, ruled by sin, might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Let's pray as we look at this section of Paul's letter. Father, as we come to your word, please show us what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and teach us how we are to live for him. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, you may like to have uh, Romans 6 open in front of you. It was on the screen, but it'll be in the Pew Bibles uh, as well in front of you. Romans chapter 6. We're going to look at those first uh, few verses. Now, I am aware on an occasion like this that with those who are here, who over the years have seen many, many baptisms and are very aware of what it is all about. But I'm also aware, of course, that there'll be people here who have probably never seen a baptism and are wondering what it is all about. So let me say a few words about baptism. Baptism, of course, is Christian initiation. It's a starting point. In the Bible, we see people who want to receive salvation from Christ coming to be baptized. It's about that start of the Christian life and involves water. Both Rebecca and Miriam have had the privilege of being raised in Christian homes. But tonight in baptism, they are, in effect, saying, I need Jesus. It's not just what we believe as a family. I personally want his life. I personally need Christ. I need his salvation. I want his salvation. And what happens in baptism symbolizes what they are receiving in Christ. Water is to do with washing. They know themselves to be sinners. That does not mean they have necessarily done awful criminal things or have been grossly immoral. And by the way, if you are someone who has done awful criminal things, if you are someone who has been grossly immoral, you are welcome to baptism. All are welcome. We all come as sinners, no matter how severe in one sense the sin might appear to everyone around us. They come as we all came, knowing that we need forgiveness, that we have not followed God as we ought, that we have not always treated people rightly. In fact, we know that there's something fundamentally wrong with us, that we are drawn to sin and do sin. 
And baptism signifies that cleansing that we receive when we come to Christ. That sin is, as it were, washed away. It's the most beautiful thing. And we are accepted by God. We come, become children. We can pray to God as children and call him Father because we've been cleansed. We are safe in God and will enjoy eternal life. We are now free to serve God with our consciences cleansed. And if you are just listening in and these things are new to, our, new to you, I just want to ask that question, would you like that cleansing? You know, so many people go through life feeling deeply, deeply guilty and ashamed. They may try and cover that over in whatever way, but deep down, and in my work, and people will sometimes come and say, look, I have made a complete mess of my life. I've broken the rules. I know the things I've done are wrong and I'm ashamed of them. They may be young, they may be old. And they ask the question, can this be for me? And the answer is yes. That cleansing is for anyone and everyone who comes. So baptism speaks of the cleansing that we receive when we come to Christ. And Rebecca and Miriam come as people who are forgiven. That symbolizes the forgiveness that they are, have received in Christ. But that raises the question. Does it matter how Rebecca and Miriam now live? Does it matter if we've come for that cleansing? Does it matter how we now live? Uh, you may know that uh, diplomats very often have immunity. When you're a high government official working in another country, in one sense you are above the law. You can't be prosecuted in that country. Now it's a bit of a grey area, but it does happen. My understanding is here, you know, if you've got diplomatic plates on and you're driving around London, you're driving around, basically if you're speeding or any parking thing, basically the police don't take it up with you, you've got to kind of, they turn a blind eye to it because they don't, you don't prosecute people. You have diplomatic immunity. Is baptism like that with God? We've got the certificate. We've got the plate. I can now drive and live how I like because I've got the cleansing. I'm not kind of under law. Do we have a kind of sin immunity because we've been accepted and are now children? Well, that's the very question that Paul is answering as he comes into Romans chapter 6. Paul, you've told us about this wonderful gospel, this free forgiveness, this grace which is given, this cleansing, this right status, this peace with God. Doesn't that mean I can just now live how I like? And answer, Paul's answer is no. And then he explains why. And it's connected with baptism. It's connected with conversion, baptism. If we can speak about coming to Christ and baptism, is one package there. It's connected with what happens when we come to Jesus. So Rebecca and Miriam, I want you to see how baptism helps you understand how you are to live. Baptism teaches us how we are to live. It teaches you and it teaches us about the Christian life. And I want to look in particular at one verse which I want to impress onto your hearts and onto your minds. I want it for all of us here who are believers to reorientate ourselves with this verse. It is chapter 6 verse 11. In the same way says Paul, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. There it is. 
That's the heart of this teaching. I think it's a little summary verse. You're to count yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. He's not saying there by counting, make yourself dead to sin. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, understand that's what you are. Count it, recognize it. A man might be messing around all Saturday, wasting his time, playing on his video games, hanging out with his mates, not doing anything useful. Reckon yourself to be a dad. <laughs> Remember that you're a dad. Remember that that brings responsibility. You're not saying go and become a dad. You're just saying you are one. You have kids, remember? Reckon with it how you are to think about yourself and your life. It's that sense here. It's remember, think, consider. And notice it's to do with how we think. Count, reckon. Understand these things. Our problems in the Christian life come because we don't understand. We don't think. We don't engage with what is true. So, we see verse 11, you are to count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And baptism helps us to teach us what it means to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So let's think about the two parts of that verse. You are dead to sin. Wow, what does that mean? Well, we've immediately got to say that it does not mean that we get rid of sin and become perfect at baptism. You know, you won't go into school tomorrow, you won't go into work tomorrow, and people go, wow. And then after a couple of weeks, your family knows, you know, you know they haven't sinned for three weeks. They've been absolutely perfect to live with for three weeks. That's not the way it works in that sense. Sin remains and is to be battled with. It's not that we become perfect on coming into Christ. So what does it mean? Well, of course, it's linked with baptism. There is a death that occurs. We'll go through to baptism in a moment. And the way we do baptism, it's not, we're not strict about how you do it, but with baptism, you go down into water. There is a dying. And these verses say that in baptism, there is a death. We are being united with Christ in some way in his death. A union with Christ in his death. We're seeing in verse 6 that there is a idea that we, the old person, is being crucified with Christ. The old man is being crucified. There's a death that's occurring. All that we were in Adam is dying. We see in these verses that Jesus Christ came to die. He came to die a death which dealt with sin. He wasn't dealing with his own sin, of course. He was dealing with our sin. His death dealt with sin, with the sin problem. So what does it mean then when you begin to look at this chapter and think about what it means to die to sin? To be dead to sin. Well, as you root around in these verses and reflect on them, I think it, it, it kind of carries three ideas. Let me just kind of rattle those off. I'll leave you to think about them. Firstly, we die to sin in the sense that we have been liberated from the penalty of sin. We've been liberated from the penalty of sin. We see that, I think, in uh, verse 7. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Actually, the words are, has been justified from sin. You've died to the sin in the sense that when you come to Christ, the penalty has been paid. Isn't that amazing? Just think about that for a moment. You and I deserve to be punished for our sins. That's right, isn't it? That's justice. Take responsibility for your sin. It deserves God's anger and wrath. And the amazing thing when we come to Christ that Christ takes that punishment and that penalty upon himself. 
And that's here in this chapter. It's a work of summary of all that Paul has been saying. We have been died to the, to the penalty of sin. It's been dealt with. But more than that, we have been, we, we've been delivered. We've died to the power of sin. We see that, I think, in verse 6. For we know that the old self was crucified with him, so the body ruled by sin might be done away with, so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. You see, without Christ, sin grips us. We're in the grip of sin. That doesn't mean we lead necessarily violent, terrible lives. But actually, actually we don't live for God. We reject God. We live our own way. That actually often sin grips us and we behave in ways that are wrong and find it very hard to shake off those ways. We think we are free. We think we can easily change ourselves. We can't. gripped by our passions. We do what we want to do, and what we do is what we want to do. And someone who comes to Christ, actually, Christ begins to break that power of sin. Begins to break that power of sin. We'll be able to begin to say no. A power enters us from outside the Holy Spirit. We still battle with sin, but we have a new power to say no. Often Christians despair over their progress. It's very interesting to see that. But when you drill down and ask them what they mean, it's often that they are focusing on their inner worlds. They feel the battle in there and the temptation in there. And they say, and I can just see my own heart, and I can see my own mind, I can see all that. There's a kind of clarity about that. But often you go, but how do you live? Are you sexually under control? Yes. Have you stopped swearing? Yes. Do you try and tell the truth? Well, I told a lie, I told a little white lie three weeks ago. But do you basically tell the truth? Yes, I do. Are you gripped by greed? No, actually, I've become generous in life. If you actually look at the bank statements. You see, Christ actually does affect a change. And many of you have experienced that change. Even though at times you think, oh, I'm not doing that very well. He's wonderfully worked in you. And transformed you. Because of his power. To stop you from being slaves to sin. So you've died to sin. You've been freed from the penalty of sin. You've been freed from the power of sin. Although that is a work in progress. And thirdly, you will in the end be freed entirely from the presence of sin. Verse 9, you see Jesus Christ and we are to imitate him in that sense. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he can no longer, again, he cannot die again. Death no longer has any mastery over him. It's almost as if Jesus Christ, well, Jesus Christ is now out of the touch. He can no longer be tempted there in glory. Sin cannot be present to him. And we are on that same road. We've died to sin. We've been freed from its penalty. We've been freed from its power. And one day we will be in the resurrection completely freed from its presence. Imagine you'd gone out in rough seas, foolishly taken out a boat in rough seas. Your boat's capsized, you've fallen in, you're in danger of drowning. You are in the grip of the sea and you are heading to death in the sea. Out comes the lifeboat. In rescuing you, the captain of the lifeboat dies, takes that death. And you are brought to shore. You are brought out of the power of the waves. You are brought out of death. You are taken up on to the shore. In one sense, you now say, I'm never going back in the sea. I've died to that. That almost killed me. That had gripped me. It was costly to rescue me. 
you walk away from it. So baptism teaches you first as you go down that you are dead to sin. Secondly, we see in the verse that baptism teaches us that we are alive to God in Christ Jesus. And in verse 11, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Would you notice again that our world is the other way around? Our world is alive to sin and dead to God. You don't have to go very far to see that. Tomorrow morning, people will talk about what they've done at the weekend, often boast about those things, and no interest in God's. We live in a world which is alive to sin and dead to God. You in Christ have become dead to sin and are alive to God in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be alive to God? When we come back to baptism, you're going to go down into the water and you're going to come up to a new life. The old self without Christ would have lived one way. The new creation with the Holy Spirit will live a different way. Same personality, same you. One would have gone that way. The new person in Christ goes that way. And by the way, this is the way of human flourishing. This is the way with Christ's Spirit that you will be what you were created to be and will become, if I can put it like that, your most beautiful self through Christ. He is the great restorer of what we are meant to be. He empowers us. And we live a new life now, and these verses tell us that, and we will be with him in the resurrection. We are raised to live a new life. This body is still dying, and we will live a new way then, and that the resurrection, we will get new bodies as well. But I just want to just dwell on this thought for a moment that uh, in 11, that we are alive to God in Christ Jesus. See, Luke, I think, really helpfully made the point this morning. And it's one of the things he does say from time to time. It's very helpful. Understanding that the Christian life is not just about what we are saved from. And that is wonderful to consider that. Wrath and judgment and sin. It's what we're saved for. We died not just so that we spend our lives saying no to sin, but that we live a new life. New creations. The Spirit working, transforming our character, equipping us for service, bearing fruit in who we are and in what we do. Not produced simply by self-will, but produced by the work of the Spirit. So the Christian, the believer... Is someone who has died to sin in Christ, to its penalty, to its power, and in the end will be free from the presence of sin. We are those who are dead to sin and now alive to God's. But we see as we look on from verse 11 that this new way that we are being dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, brings with it new obligations. New obligations. Our royal family, I'm sure you've noticed, has certain obligations. It comes with who they are. Uh, Prince William was born into the royal family. All of them were, of course. He didn't earn it. That is who he is by birth. And the royal family, because of who they are, have to be out, behave in certain ways. There are don'ts and there are do's because of who they are. I'm not totally up on things, all things royal, but I did Google it to see what they can't do, what the don'ts are and what the do's are. 
I think actually I knew them when I saw them listed out. They don't comment on politics. They do not. Of course, they try and sneak it in, but actually they should not. Do not is their rule. They do not give autographs or selfies, apparently. Is that right? Anyone seen them doing autographs or selfies? No, they don't. They do not do that. They do not have two close heirs traveling on the same aeroplane. There's a whole lot of do nots. There's food stuff as well that they will not eat. Do not. Because of who you are, do not. And then, of course, there are a list of do's. They must go to certain state events. They must do their charity work. And hardest of all, I reckon, is they must wear what they have to wear. They just got to wear it. There's no choice on those events. That's what they have to wear because of who they are. Well, those who are baptized are now in King Jesus. You are part of that royal family. You are now dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And there are some don'ts and there are some do's. They're very good don'ts and they're very good do's. Did you notice them in verse 12 and 13? Do not, okay? Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its evil desires. There's a saying, no, to sin. You still dwell, it still troubles you. Because of who you are, dead to sin, alive to God in Christ, you now do not do not let sin reign. You could say no to sin. Connected to that, there's another do not in 13. Do not offer your, any part of yourself as sin, um, to sin as instrument of wickedness. You don't offer any part of you. Your tongue, your eyes, your hands, your feet to sin. Do not. And it brings with it a do. But rather, verse 13, offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as instruments of righteousness. This offering is the language of sacrifice. And this will come later in Romans, in Romans chapter 12, where you offer your bodies as living sacrifices. You offer yourself in his service, in my work, in my leisure, in my family, in my studies. I offer myself and I do things his way, in love, as his servant and subject. So as we begin to wrap up, I want to encourage you all who are believers to take 6.11 to heart. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. As I wake up in the morning, I thank God for the grace that he's given me in Christ. And I say, today, how am I going to live? What's the shape of my life? I'm dead to sin. I'm going to say no. And I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus, and I'm going to serve him and serve him well in all that I do. That's the shape of the Christian life. The simple shape. United to Christ in his death, we die to sin, and we are raised to live a new life by the power of the Holy Spirit, being transformed by him, renewing our thinking, working to change our character, and bearing fruit in lives of love and service. And I just want to invite those who are not yet believers, are not yet in Christ. Would you like this life? Do you know what is beautiful about it? It's one of the things that is the forgiveness that you have. You know God and you have purpose in life. Because no matter how ordinary your life, you are serving Christ in your life. You know where your life is heading. You know that your life has meaning. 
Does that draw you? I hope it does. Because if you want that life, you can have that life. If you will come to Jesus Christ and ask for forgiveness, ask for that life, and he will grant it to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can say of Rebecca and Miriam that they have been brought from death to life. We thank you for these great truths that we have died to sin and that we are now being made alive in Christ and are to be alive to you, our God, in Christ Jesus. Help us all to be reorientated by this. And again, we pray for Rebecca and Miriam that they would live well for Christ all of their lives. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing Take My Life and Let It Be. It is a wonderful song of offering. And I wonder whether if you are a new believer that you just want to pray this from the heart, that you would give your lives to God tonight to get, you know, uh, tonight and I want to serve you. And if you have been a believer for many years, this is a good chance, isn't it? Just to say, my life is your life, Lord. Take it and use it in whatever way. Let's stand and sing.